Just wanted to say good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for this lecture on this beautiful Tuesday night. Um, we have Dr. Celine Parekh, who is going to be presenting about minimally invasive foot and ankle surgery. He um, is one of our newer physicians here at Rothman, but has been in practice for over 15 years. Um, he sees patients in our Newtown office, Princeton and Ben Salem, really amazing surgeons. So, um, will be you'll be learning lots of really interesting things and hopefully you know learning a little bit about um issues that you're having and he can answer any questions um i will be able to see any questions that you may have in the q a and at the end of his talk he and i will go through the questions and try to answer everybody um the talk will be posted on youtube um within about a week and you'll get an email from me with the link um so without further ado i will turn Turn it over to Dr. Parekh. Thanks, Kristen, and thanks everybody for joining tonight. Um, we've had a lot of rain here recently, so I appreciate everybody coming out and, and listening to this on a day that's not so rainy. Um, like Kristen said, I just uh, joined recently Rothman. I was in practice for 17 years in North Carolina, originally from North Jersey, and so it's nice to be back to the area and be able to uh, get my bagels and my pizzas and and kind of drive the way I grew up driving. So um, tonight we're gonna to talk about minimally invasive foot and ankle surgery. And it's been an interest of mine for about uh, the last 10 years um, and has really um, become one of the more exciting parts of foot and ankle surgery. So here's some of my conflicts of interest uh, for you to be aware of. When we talk about minimally inv invasive surgery, what exactly are we meaning? Well. These are specialized surgical approaches to procedures that we used to do with open techniques, with bigger incisions, and where we would strip bone and do the surgeries to, to solve patients' issues. So the idea here is to use smaller incisions, reduce tissue disruption and trauma compared to the older open techniques. Now to do this with smaller incisions, we do rely on special instruments and special um, uh, x-rays or fluoroscopy techniques that we employ in the operating room so that we can make sure we're getting the correction and doing the procedure the way we anticipate. The idea for patients is with these minimally invasive techniques, we can min minimize scarring, we can improve the pace of your healing, hopefully get you back to doing what you want sooner, decrease post-operative pain, and even some of that post-operative um, um, swelling. And all of that is to mean we're hoping that we get better outcomes for patients who undergo minimally invasive surgery. So the way I'm going to structure this talk is really around different conditions of the foot and ankle and how we, we and I in, in my practice and some of my partners here at Rothman are using minimally invasive surgery to address some of the more common foot and ankle problems. So one of the most common things we see in the Western world are bunions, and they come in a variety of different colors and sizes and associated issues from the mild all the way to the severe. And here's a patient of mine that had a bunion, 46 years old. The bunion was on the left side and was having increasing pain in the inner aspect of that big toe. And you can see that area of redness. And it was getting to the point where it was bothering this person, this person on a daily basis. And so we get an x-ray and this is how we initially will, will review the bunion. We take a look and it's a moderate bunion, but not super big, but it was bothering her nonetheless. And so we have to keep in mind all of the nerves, the blood vessels, the tendons, the ligaments, but our goal after surgery is to give this patient a big toe that is straight and lined up with a variety of different ways. So the way we do this, and I just wanted to kind of give you an idea on a step-by-step -step basis, is we deploy fluoroscopy, which is intraoperative x-rays, to take pictures as we're doing these steps through small incisions. So we place these wires in, into place in that big toe. And once we like where it is, we'll actually take a burr, which is basically like a pencil with, with uh, cutting edges on it. And it spins around and you see that coming in from the left of that big toe, coming in and it cuts into the bone. And that's through a small, tiny incision as well. Once we cut into that bone, 
we use the same incision to be able to shift the bone that we cut over. So the base of it stays where we want and the head of it moves over. And once we move that head over, we can advance that initial pin that I put in and hold it into place. And so that big toe bone has been cut and shifted into place. Once that happens, we can put a screw in place and hold that in position. We then usually wanna cut the next bone down on the toe, the one that's right by your nail. And so we put the same, we do the same thing. We put this little wire in place. We take the burr, we do another cut. Once we like where that is, we will actually finish the cut, advance that initial wire and put a screw across that as well. And so when we're done, the bunion looks straight with one, two or three screws, depending on how much a patient may need. And just from this x-ray alone, you can see that the big toe is much straighter and the bump on the inner aspect of that big toe is gone. So what does this look like? Well, the traditional incisions that we use for bunions are what you see here on the left side. This is a drawing of what it looks like. It's a fairly large incision, about four centimeters in length based on the inner aspect of your big toe. And we do a lot of work through that traditional incision when we do these open techniques. And I still will do open techniques. There are times when we cannot offer patients minimally invasive surgery and we have to do these open techniques. Lapidus procedures or lapoplasty is another open technique. And this is an incision for a patient who had a lapidus procedure. And you can see, again, a fairly large incision that is on the top of the, of the foot. The problem with these incisions, even though they are helpful for us to see what we want and do what we need, some of the problems that arise with big, these big incisions is that the wounds can sometimes struggle to heal. They can take longer to heal. They can fall apart a little bit and bacteria can jump in and set up infections. Um, some of those infections can be superficial just in the skin, but sometimes they can dive in deeper to the bone. And so by doing minimally invasive surgery, you don't get rid of all those problems, but you minimize all those problems. And because these are tiny incisions, you don't have to worry about a lot of those issues. Now you still have to wait for the bone to heal, but because you didn't strip the bones, it typically heals a little bit faster than the open technique and with a little bit less swelling and a little bit less pain than the open techniques. And you can see on the right-hand side, the MIS, these are five small incisions on this patient, each closed with one stitch to show you how small these incisions can be for these minimally invasive cases. Here's a patient of mine who had a bunion with a second toe that was drifting towards the big toe. And so we went in and did a procedure uh, similar to what I showed you in the first case, but we also had to do something open. And the reason I want to show you this is because sometimes we will do the bone cuts in our in our minimally invasive technique, but we still have to also do something open. And so in this case, this patient's ligament, which I'm showing right here through a cadaver tissue, this ligament had to be repaired and tightened because the bunion had caused that, that ligament to basically lose its ability to hold the big toe where we needed it. It had essentially stretched out. And so the bone cut was done minimally invasively. And then we did a smaller incision to tighten up that ligament. And so this patient had a combination of a minimally invasive with a little bit of an open to be able to get her the outcome she wanted. And this is what it looks like at the latest follow-up. And she's been happy and has done well with this. Now, sometimes the big toe can go in the opposite direction, right? So it's not leaning towards the smaller toes, which is called a bunion or hallux valgus, but it's actually leaning outwards or, or I should say inwards away from the other toes. And that's called some, something we call hallux varus. And so here's a patient of mine, 65 years old, had this hallux varus. You see that big toe on this x-ray is heading towards the left, um, towards the away from the other parts of the, of the, of the foot. And so we did a procedure here um, called the reverse man, where we go in, do this cut in an open technique to be able to create uh, the alignment we want of that big toe. And then minimally invasively, just like I showed you in that first case, we can do the second bone cut. And so our incision doesn't have to be two incisions that are about three centimeters in length, but she gets 
one incision that's about three centimeters in length, in length, and then a poke hole incision for the second bone cut. And again, it's this combination. And so as you start using minimally invasive surgery from a surgeon's perspective, I use it as a tool to you to do things that I would otherwise need to do in an open manner if I'm able to do it minimally invasively. And so, like I said, sometimes I'll do it exclusively minimally invasively. Sometimes I'll do it in association with part opens, or sometimes I have to do a full open technique. This is a patient who had a bunionette. So a bunionette is basically where this blue arrow is pointing. It's where the small toe is leaning towards the other toes. And you end up with this area of redness, pain, swelling over the fifth head of the bone called the fifth metatarsal. So it's the opposite of a bunion in that it's the small toe that's involved. But we can do this minimally invasively as well. And I want to show you how fast this can be done. So here's a patient that I had done a minimally invasively. Um, and the point of this is not to necessarily say, hey, we, we can do these quickly in this fast surgery, but it's to show you how it changes the incisions, it changes the bone cuts, and it allows us to get the patients off the table much faster. And so here, I'm not sure, here you go. You could see that fluoroscopy, the x-rays, live x-rays on one side, my hand on the left side, we're operating on the x-ray itself, and we're doing this bone cut, and it literally takes about 30 seconds to do one of these bone cuts. Um, and then we shift the bone where I want it, and it gets held in place just by the ligaments and tendons that were not disrupted because we didn't open this toe up fully. And then there was a second cut I need to, needed to do on the toe. And so I can make a small incision there. And again, under live x-ray, I can take the burr, I can do that bone cut, and that takes about another 30 seconds to do. And, and all in all, from the time that I start this surgery for a bunionette to the time I'm finished, it's under 10 minutes, which means the patients are not exposed to as much anesthesia or off the table sooner, faster, quicker. And then all the benefits, like I told you about minimally invasive surgery from the incisions and to the recovery. Um, and I'm just about done here and I straightened it out. So another condition where we use this for is other misalignment problems. So patients can have flat feet and that's called pes planus but they can also have high arches and that's called a cavus foot. It's where your foot, your, your arch is like a cave. So it's a cavus foot. And, and a lot of times with that, the heel bone is tilting inwards. And you can see this patient where their heel bone is tilting inwards. Normally our heel bones want to tilt outwards or at the very least be neutral. So this patient had a cavus foot deformity, 55 year old female, cavus foot deformity, it's progressing, is having pain on the outer part of the ankle because as that ankle turns inwards, like her right ankle is, it puts a lot of pressure on those outer ligaments. And so we get an MRI to, to evaluate these patients. And you can see here, this is the heel bone. I know you guys don't see MRIs often, but this heel bone is turned in where it really should be turned out. And so our old way of doing these uh, incisions is to make this big incision um, on, on, on the lateral or outer aspect of the big uh, of the fifth toe, and then do a bone cut of your heel bone through a big incision on the outer part of your heel bone, cut the heel bone with a big saw, and then move the heel bone over. And in the second incision, the one that's back by your Achilles here, that incision again is about three centimeters or four centimeters traditionally but now we can do it with a poke hole. So the other parts of the surgery I can't do with a poke hole, but this part of it I can. And so we can cut the heel bone, we can shift it over, we can get that alignment so that it's not inwards, but more neutral or outwards. And we hold it in place with a screw and this patient goes on to recover. One less incision that they have to worry about. Other incisions are still healing through open techniques. Other lumps and bumps can be addressed through minimally invasive surgery. So here's a patient of mine, was a soldier, is a soldier, was shot in the foot with friendly fire, was in the military, had a washout of this done. This is not the picture of this patient, but it just represents what these wounds would look like. And this patient comes in and his MRI shows that he's got this bright white stuff in his bone. This is bone cement filled with antibiotics that the army physicians have put into the bone to try to clear the infection. Pus is pouring out of the entrance and the exit area of this wound. 
and he's offered an amputation, which would have ended his career in the military. So he comes to see me because he really wants to stay in the military. That's what his dream was to continue to be a soldier. And he wanted to figure out a way to save his limb. So we go in, we clean out the infection. We plan for um, 3D printing of the bone that was lost. And this is kind of the, the video you're seeing of this really complicated implant that's 3D printed. We take the patient to the operating room. We take away that antibiotic cement. And then we put this 3D printed implant to replace the bone that was lost. So after surgery, after he heals, this is what it looks like. And you can see this fluff of bone underneath my metal implant. So a year later, this fluff of bone becomes harder and harder, and he feels like he's walking on a rock. It's getting to the point where it's really becoming painful for him to do the things he wants to do. So we can use minimally invasive surgery to go in and clear out these bone spurs. And so poke hole incision, I can go in, shave away the bone that was on this implant, and the patient within a week is back to, to his military duties, missed very little time and has no issues. That bone is gone. It's amazing what we can do with these, these tools. Here's another alignment issue. This is a case of an 81 year old female had broken her ankle and it was treated non-surgically. So it was treated with a cast. Eight months later, she comes in to see me. First time I've seen her and she's having a lot of pain walking on this. Now, again, I don't expect you guys to know how to read these x-rays, but I drew red lines here. And what you can see is that the leg bone is coming straight and then the ankle shifts outwards to the right. And that's not the way the ankle is supposed to be. It should be lined up nice and straight. And so what happened here is her break healed angled. And so she now is walking more on the inner aspect of her foot than the outer aspect of her foot. And she feels like she's falling over. So in this case, we she needs something called an ankle fusion. So we go in, open technique, we open the front of her ankle, clean it all out, but I've got to get this lined up better. So minimally invasively, we can actually recreate her bone breaks. So where she had them broken before, I can make poke hole incisions, cut the two bones. That makes this ankle really flexible for me. And it allows me to shift this ankle back where it belongs and lock it into place with these plates and screws. And so instead of getting three big incisions that are about four or five, six centimeters in length, which would be fraught with a lot of wound complications, she's got one big incision and two tiny incisions that allows her to recover much more reliably without any major wound care problems. Now, you've heard of plantar fasciitis. Uh, it's fairly common. It can very oftentimes be associated with a heel spur. The heel spur does not cause pain. But if you see the circle here, sometimes the heel spur can have a lot of inflammation around it or can be broken. And in those cases, it can be one of the drivers of patient's pain. So just like I, sh I showed you in the soldier, we can put the bone spur in, uh, the bone burr in and shave away the spur on the bottom of the heel and get rid of that spur for the patient. And that helps their pain get better. In addition, this patient needed the nerve decompressed and needed her plantar fascia lengthened. And all, that's all done um, at the same time. The only part that's done minimally invasively is the, the shave down of the bone spur. Here's a patient of mine who had an ankle replacement, was doing well for a while. But if we zoom in on this, started having more pain on the outer part of that limb. So when we zoom into this x-ray, um, there's this fluff of bone here. This is called impingement. It's where this patient developed more bone against the implant. And that bone now, that bone growth is rubbing against the metal implant, causing pain for her. The old way that we used to have to do this is we'd have to reopen this whole old incision. Again, a, a large incision in the front of the ankle. And we'd have to, through that open incision, clean out this bone spur. But now with minimally invasive surgery, we don't need to do that. Small incision, we can poke that burr in there, clean this out. Within a week, she's walking on it and well on her way. If I had done this the old traditional way, she would have been in a cast, not walking on it for three weeks, then in a boot for three weeks, and then back into her shoes. So much more expedited return to activity. Here's a patient of ours that needed a bone cut 
from an old shin bone fracture that did not heal properly. So the, this, this shin bone fracture was treated non-surgically. And again, you can see my red lines, they're not parallel. They're actually angled inwards. And so this ankle is inwards versus being right underneath her shin bone. So through an open technique, we open up the inner part of her shin bone. We do the bone cut. But through a percutaneous technique, from MIS technique, we cut what's called a fibula, that smaller bone on the outer part of your leg. And we cut it so that I can realign the entire leg, hold it in place with plates and screws, and again, minimizes wound complications in a high risk surgery. This is a patient, curious patient of mine, came in from the Middle East. This is not his pictures. It is his x-rays, but not his picture. But he had something similar to this known as a clubfoot deformity. So he came in to see me and we did his first surgery, which was to do the old open technique of putting plates and screws and fusing multiple bones and locking this all so it was better, not perfect, but better. And one of the problems, and you can see all these staples here, so you can see how long this is, these incisions are. The wound took longer to heal, had some wound complications. The patient ends up with an infection. So now we have to go back in, take out all the hardware, clear the infection, and we lost some of our correction. This, this foot is still kind of arched. So he's still having pain. In fact, this patient's wound continued to have a hard time healing to the point where the plastic surgeons had to do some muscle flaps to move muscles from one part of the body to this right ankle to get coverage so these wounds would heal. And this is, this is what I'm talking about. Sometimes these incisions can struggle to heal. So we clear the infection and this patient says, Dr. Parekh, I still, I'm walking somewhat on the outer side of my foot, which is painful what else can be done? So in this situation, if I did not have minimally invasive surgery, I would have told them not really much more to do. We narrowly escaped an amputation last time. I don't want to put you at risk again. But with minimally invasive surgery, we have options. So again, small incisions, we can do multiple bone cuts. And I'm going to show you what it looks like in the next x-ray, but put on this frame, which is almost like the uh, the old... Um, Erector sets. Frame shoots pins into the bones, holds the bones together after I cut them in the alignment that I want. And you can see his foot is better lined up. His bones are healing. I did about four bone cuts all through one, through four small incisions. Did not have to worry about his flap, did not have to worry about bone healing or stripping of, of soft tissue. So it really allowed this patient to get the outcome he wanted without putting his, his limb at risk. I'm going to play this for you, and I'm going to stay quiet for a sec. Let me make sure this is loud. So you guys have all probably heard of an Achilles tendon tear. Now you've actually heard it actually happen in somebody who posted on TikTok. Achilles tears um, do happen. Um, it's one of the most common tears of the ankle, and it uh, can be quite debilitating. One of the more famous Achilles ruptures was Kobe Bryant, and he had his Achilles repaired in the old techniques, which is where we make these big incisions, almost half of the length of the leg bone to get to the Achilles tendon and to put it back together. Same issues of open techniques done elsewhere. You can have wound complications up to 10 to 15%. Sometimes this could mean additional surgeries back to the operating room. Sometimes it would mean that you'd have to immobilize patients for up to six weeks in a cast, not walking on this so that the wound would heal more reliably. So this is not what we do anymore, right? This is, uh, this is the old open techniques. Now, I do something called a mini open. So it's not through a one small incision, but it's about a two centimeter incision where we can, we can go in, capture both ends of the tear, and we can bring them back together and suture them into place. 
And that allows for patients to be mobilized sooner because you don't have to worry about the wound complications, which means they can rehab faster, do the activities they want sooner, and return to place sooner. And so this is a patient of mine who posted this on social media and uh, gave me permission to use this. But I want to show you what he's doing. Keep going. When they tell you you can't, come on, man, who are they? When they tell you you're not going to make it, don't believe them, man. Don't believe them. you got to be relentless. Don't give up. Don't give up. Stay in it. Stay focused. Quitting guarantees the failure. Once you quit, it rules out any chance of succeeding. The mere waking up every... So he did this video four and a half months out from his surgery. And uh, phenomenal, right? This is much more rapid than we would see in terms of a recovery compared to open traditional techniques. These are the type of techniques now the NFL guys like Cam Akers number 23 got when he had his surgery, where we're doing these small incisions. And I didn't do Cam Akers surgery, but um, we're doing these small incisions so that our pro athletes, our recreational athletes, our non-athletic patients are able to get back to doing what they want quicker, sooner, faster. And, and the next condition I want to talk to you about is called a fibula fracture. This is a break of the ankle on the outer bone that's involved. And so there are a variety of different ways you can break it, a variety of different anatomies of this break. Um, and these are three different patterns of the fibula fracture. It's the smaller bone of your ankle. Now, in general, when we treat patients with ankle fractures, our goals are to reduce the joint surface, put the bone where it belongs properly, hold it in place through the healing phase, and again, try to get patients moving as early as possible. We want to try to avoid this, and this is what can happen in our old techniques, and hopefully none of you are eating right now, and I apologize if you are. But our old technique is a large incision, six, seven, eight, ten, nine, ten centimeters in length, a long incision. But remember, this patient broke their ankle. And so the soft tissues, not only the bone, were damaged. And we're cutting through that soft tissue that's been damaged. And so these patients can swell a lot before surgery. They can swell a lot after surgery. And when that happens, the wounds can break down. And when the wounds break down, now you can be looking at hardware. And this is not what we want. This gets all surgeons really, really worried because now your plate and screws are exposed to the outside world, which means bacteria can latch onto this, jump on the implant, grow on the implants, get into your bone, and you end up with something called osteomyelitis. And that can put your limb at risk. So this is something that really we don't want and don't like. So um, I helped to develop one of these fibular nails, which is a minimally invasive way to address one of the most common ankle fractures um, in, in people. And so it is, it's the fibula fracture. And so we can take the break and put a nail in it and make a small incision, usually two to three small incisions, and be able to put this nail into the bone. And so this is what a typical plate incision would look like on the left and look at the nail incision on the right. What that means for patients is we can let you walk on it, depending on the pattern of your fracture, anywhere from the same day of your surgery to two weeks after your surgery in a boot. And by week six, you're out of the boot working with therapy compared to our old ways of keeping you in a cast, not walking on, on it for four to six weeks, waiting the wound to heal, then you're in a boot for a month, then you're back in your shoes. And so we can cut those timelines down so you can get to what you want to do. So this is a patient who was about four weeks out from the surgery. She had a, a nail placed and she's able to walk on this without a boot, doing well. If you get you going faster, there's less swelling, there's less pain. We can get you back to doing what you want sooner. So in conclusion, minimally invasive surgery is here to stay. It continues to be more and more available throughout the U.S. The advantages are reducing post-operative pain and discomfort, 
faster recovery times, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, less scarring, small incisions, minimal blood loss, and reduced risk of infection. Thanks. And I'm Great. That was so interesting. Questions. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so the first question is, how long has minimally, minimally invasive surgery been available for bunionectomy? So globally, minimally invasive surgery really took off faster in Europe and Asia than it did in the U.S. So it's been around in Europe and Asia about 15 years. But in the U.S., about seven years is really um, how, how much bunion surgery minimally invasively has been available. Great. Um, and I have Morton's neuroma in my right foot for about 15 years. About seven years ago, I had a cryogenic procedure done, which didn't help with shrinking the tumor. Are there any other procedures presently and anything you could recommend? Well, Morton's neuromas can be associated with many different things. Um, so it's hard for me to give you medical advice right through social uh, through a talk, but I would suggest making sure you follow up with your local foot and ankle surgeon, have them evaluate you, do a thorough workup, and then they could talk to you about next options. If you go online, you're going to find a lot of um, non-peer-reviewed options that don't have a lot of good data. So you really want to be careful what you're reading online for for options for Morton's neuromas. Great. Um, what is the re recovery time for a shaved bone spur? Um, depending on where it is, you could be walking on it anywhere from the same day of your surgery to two weeks after your surgery, and then back in your shoes, depending again on if it was just a shave down procedure, or is it associated with something else? If it's associated with something else, those timelines may be a little bit different. Right. And then we just have a couple questions about um, what procedures you can do minimally invasive surgery for. So um, they're asking for posterior tib tibial tendon dysfunction. Can we do mi minimally invasive? So for the tendon work that's associated with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, that cannot be done minimally invasively. However, that heel bone cut that oftentimes is done with flat foot deformity surgery that can be done minimally invasively, similar to the, the case I showed you um, for the patient who had the high arch. That bone cut, the heel bone cut, is done the same exact way, but in sh instead of shifting the heel bone to the outer part of the outer, uh, outer part of the foot, you're shifting it towards the inner part of the foot. But it's the same uh, kind of technique, one small incision, and we cut the heel bone. So part of that surgery can be done minimally invasively. What about um, uh, minimally invasive surgery for posterior tibial tendon tears? Um, again, similar to for flat foot, that the tendon work that's associated with that um, is not done through any minimally invasive technique. It has to be done open. Okay. Um, is there anything you can do for severe arthritic fused ankles? Um, that is something, again, to speak to a orthopedic surgeon like myself, who's uh, very um, comfortable with ankle replacements. For patients who do have fused ankles, sometimes we can reverse it and give you an ankle replacement into those fused ankles. So it all depends on the patient's um, conditions, comorbidities, and what the uh, extras look like for the bone. Um, I had a severe bunion and had the next toe amputated. Now the next toe over is pushed up like the one that was amputated. Can the bunion be repaired and the toe saved minimally invasively? And how long is the recovery? So again, hard for me to tell you for sure in your specific case, but when you look at that spectrum that I showed of bunions all the way from mild, moderate to severe, as you get to the severe case, sometimes those need to be done in an open technique. I won't tell you always, but sometimes they would need to be done in open technique. And the only way you know that is by going to somebody who does both open and minimally invasive like me, who will be able to tell you what your options are, depending on what your extras look like and the associated deformities. And then some of those deformities that are associated with your lesser toes can be done minimally invasively as well, but it is patient specific depending on the other things going on for that toe. 
Uh, great. Um, I had a Bosworth fracture repair in February 2022 and now have plates and screws. Do you ever suggest removing the hardware now that I'm healed? Not um, unless you're having problems with hardware. There are very few times that we routinely recommend removing hardware in the U.S. Typically, the advice is um, we keep the hardware unless they bother people. And less than 1% of the time do they really bother people. Um the times that we routinely will take out hardware is if you've had screws placed for a Liz Frank injury or screws placed for a syndesmosis injury. In those situations, we will plan hardware removal, but otherwise it's only if it irritates you. Um, can you talk about tarsal tunnel syndrome? Sure. So tarsal tunnel syndrome is a condition of the nerve similar to the carpal tunnel syndrome of your hand. It's where you get pressure on the nerve and, and the number one cause for that pressure is actually a, a cyst that's pushing on the nerve. Sometimes you can have um, engorged veins that run along with the nerve, pushing on the nerve. But, but what patients end up with is heel pain that doesn't get better, or they can actually have some numbness and tingling or even um, loss of, of the, the muscle girth. So you get some muscle atrophy. So those are the kind of symptoms patients can have. Um, most patients, when, by the time they're starting to have neurologic symptoms with tarsal tunnel syndrome, they usually need surgery where we go in and decompress the nerve, similar to what you'd get for a carpal tunnel syndrome. Thank you. Um, I guess this is, it says, how about internal pronation of the foot? I guess that's, can, can you do minimal a minimally invasive procedure for internal pronation of the foot? Uh, some of the bone cuts can be done minimally invasively for that type of surgery. Not all of them though. Hey, um, hi, and thank you for this wonderfully informative webinar. I've been recently told I may need bunion surgery and was told the second toe was a hammer toe. Is a bunion and hammer toe surgery ever performed at the same time? If you, in my hands, yes, oftentimes they're done at the same time because these go hand in hand. And if you only fix one, the second one still is symptomatic. So we typically will do both at the same time. What can be done for osteoarthritis causing pain in a stress fracture? Uh, osteoarthritis is basically the wear and tear of your joints. And there's the ankle is very common, but the joint underneath the ankle can have it as well, as well as the big toe. Um, if the pressure in the bones gets bad enough, you, you can develop a stress fracture. Um, it's really a matter of what's the driver of your pain. Is it the arthritis or the stress fracture? Um, and, and sometimes both are. And so you've got to figure out which one are you addressing, depending on where the arthritis is located. You might need a fusion or a joint replacement. Depending on where the stress fracture is, sometimes it can be treated without surgery with some period of immobilization, vitamin D. Sometimes you need surgery for it, to put hardware in there to strengthen the bone. So it really just depends on your individual situation. Um, will this type of surgery do anything for arthritis? Um, so for patients who have arthritis of the big toe, we can shave down bone spurs per, uh, through minimally invasive techniques. Um, if you get to the point where you've got really arthritic uh, joint and you need a fusion, we can do a fusion minimally invasively. Um, however, when you're talking about other joints like the ankle, um, you can do a little bit of minimally invasive stuff, but we really prefer to open it because we want to put the plates and screws on there for a fusion to lock that joint up. And if you have ankle arthritis, a lot of times patients just want an ankle replacement so that they can have motion. Sorry, um, is there any minimal invasive, minimally invasive surgery for bone on bone in the ankle? Uh, only if you wanted a fusion. So if you wanted a fusion, there are options to do that. It's usually with an arthroscopic assisted type of surgery where with the arthroscopy, we're looking in the joint with the camera. And then with these burrs, we're cleaning up the joint to make them raw and then we lock it into place with screws only. You can't do it with plates, it's screws only. So if you were a patient who wanted a fusion, not a joint, an ankle replacement, depending on your comorbidities, depending on uh, deformities, sometimes they can be done uh, minimally invasively.
Um, great. And does an ankle fusion limit mobility or would a replacement be better? So an ankle replacement fuses or locks up your ankle joint, which means you will lose all the up and down motion of your ankle. Um, it gives you 90% pain relief or better, but because that ankle is locked into place, you don't move it anymore. That energy that used to be going through your ankle it still has to get absorbed by your body. So you will wear down the joint above the ankle, which is your knee, and the joint below the ankle, which is the subtalar joint sooner. So those things might need surgery. Everybody who has a fusion has a limp. Some people it's, a no, it's noticeable, others it's not. Where you would end up independent individually, no way to predict. With an ankle replacement, you will have motion. It won't be normal motion, but you'll have motion. And because you have motion, you walk no more normally. And because you walk more normally, you do decrease the stress on the other joints. And it also gives you a 90% rate of pain reduction similar to an ankle fusion. Um, is minimally invasive surgery the future for ankle replacements? Um, that unfortunately is not on the horizon as, as right now, because to do an ankle replacement, we need to put these big pieces of metal into your joint. And then we have to put a big piece of plastic to keep those metal pieces apart from each other. There's really no way to do that minimally invasively as of today. Now, I think in the future, 20, 30 years from now, there'd have to be breakthroughs in metallurgy to do that. Or maybe there comes a day, and this is just pie in the sky type thing, where we can inject some uh, some stem cells or cartilage cells and suddenly it regrows in your joint. That's kind of imagination right now, but maybe at some point in the future that happens. Uh, what is the recovery time for a shaved bone spur? Depending on location and what it's for and whether or not you have any associated procedures with it, it can be as quick as walking on it the same day in a, in a special shoe, a post-operative shoe, to waiting two weeks before you're in a shoe, or if you've had any other, other associated procedures, those may set the timelines versus just the bone spur shave down. Um, and I think this looks like pretty much the last question. Do you use 10X procedure in your practice? And if yes, what for? What about shockwave therapy? And what's the difference between the two? And when do you use one versus the other? So I don't use 10X um, because the data on it from from what I've looked at is not reliable. Um, patients don't always have uh, a good outcome. And oftentimes it's not covered entirely by insurance. And so from my perspective, I don't wanna offer a patient something that might not work. From a shockwave therapy perspective, um, the studies have shown the high energy shockwave therapy works more effectively than the low energy. The high wave shock, high wave shockwave therapy, high energy shockwave therapy can be very painful. And so it's recommended that's done in the operating room. That's not covered by insurance. The low energy shockwave therapy, not as reliable, can be done in the office, but the data on it's not good and insurance doesn't cover it. So I don't do either of those. Um, and the last question is, where is your favorite pizza? I am new to Central Jersey. I grew up in North Jersey. So if you're up from North Jersey, um, there's a place called Starlight Pizzeria in West Orange, which was phenomenal. Another place called Franco's Pizzeria in West Caldwell, which was great. I'm still trying out places here to figure out my favorite pizza. I haven't tried all of them to, to have a favorite yet, but Conti's in, in Princeton is pretty good. Um, and one last question. What about PRP? Uh, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. It's basically where you go to the surgeon's office or a, a sports medicine physician's office. They take blood out of your vein. They'll concentrate it down. They will get the platelets concentrated in a high um, uh, in a high concentration, and then they inject that into different areas. The data on that is mixed, and depending on what you're using it for. Um, not so effective and the studies, other studies have not been able to replicate the initial success of early studies. I'm a much bigger fan of stem cell therapy. Um, I use stem cells fairly often in the operating room and I get it from the patient's own bone. 
Um, before I came up to Philadelphia, we used to do lipid based stem cells where we would do liposuction in my office, harvest your stem cells and re-inject it into areas where you were having pain for arthritis, for tendonitis, for plantar fasciitis was very effective. Insurance didn't cover it. So that was the biggest issue, but it is, a, in my opinion, in my experience, much more effective than PRP. Great. Well, I think that was the last question. Thank you again. This was, I learned a lot. So um, hopefully the rest of our attendees did. Um, like I said, if you have um, any interest in scheduling an appointment with Dr. Parekh, you all have my email address. Um, and I believe you have also have my phone number so you can contact me and I'll help you get set up with our scheduler. Um, and other than that, like I said, you will, the presentation will be emailed out to you um, within within about a week. It'll be up on YouTube. So thank you so much, Dr. Preck. That was really informative. Thanks, Kristen. And thanks, everybody, for uh, hanging out this evening. All righty. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.